Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Sorry, it's taken a minute to get started. It's always great. Um, thank you for being here at 9 a.m. on a Friday after a very intense conference is always um, a hard sell. So, so congratulations on, on making it, and we're very grateful for your um, attendance. Um, my name is Alexandra otolia -Bed. I'm a lecturer in digital history and culture at the University of Portsmouth, and I'm also a researcher at the British Museum. And I'm here alongside uh, the marvelous and wonderful and esteemed contributors and editors of the 2023 UCL Press volume volume on making in the digital humanities, the scholarship of digital humanities development in honor of John Bradley. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that today. Um, before we get started, um, just how we're going to run the, the format of this, um, we're going to give you a brief overview of the book and how it was conceived and the brainchild behind it. Um, we're then going to give you an overview of a couple of the chapters to give you a taster um, of what the book's about. And then we want to pick up on some of the running themes and ideas and questions that are at the heart of actually the entirety of the volume um, and work through in a kind of uh, round table discussion some of those questions. And we'll have plenty of time for open discussion and questions because we would obviously very much value your thoughts on this idea of making and the processes of making and collaboration, especially in digital humanities. Um, so I, I'm going to pass straight over to um, the wonderful Jeffrey Rockwell um, before our authors and contributors will then uh, introduce themselves and their chapters um, uh, beforehand. And in the meantime, I will also try and pass around the only copy I have of the book. Um, Ryanair did not allow me to carry more than, than one for weight restrictions, but I will try and pass it around for those who are interested. So I pass over to Jeffrey um, to start us off. Uh, thank you. So first of all, I should say all of you way back in the distance, you, you, you can come forward um, and sit up closer or not. <laughs> this reminds me of my, of my classes. You know, wherever I am, the students sit as far as they can. And, and I've, I've come to think that there's a plot of some sort. Anyway, this, um, I actually do not remember when we first conceived of this book. It's sort of but it was, it came out of a conversation that Stefan Sinclair and I had, and uh, our ongoing conversations around, and experiments around uh, developing software and arguing about software and so on like that. And um, as part of it, we began to reflect on, um, and some of you have probably heard papers that we've given about people like John B. Smith and Sally Sedlow and so on like that. We were reflecting on different people who had invested their careers in making. And that led us to, uh, of course, Tact and John Bradley. And we realized because John had retired, this was a good time to think about making with him and also in honor of the makings that he did at, at, the, at King's College and earlier at the University of Toronto. We very early realized that this was not something we could do alone. And we're extremely fortunate that Julianne joined us and then Alexandra. Uh, and doubly fortunate because, as some of you know, Stefan Sinclair passed in August of 2020, and, uh, and so we were extremely lucky that there was uh, a group of people. We did get permission from his widow that he could, because he had put a lot of work into this in the early phase, that he could still be listed as, uh, as one of the co-editors. This was uh, deliberate, and, and the publisher supported it. I should, the last thing I'm going to say before passing it to Julianne is the, um, the cover was generated, uh, was part of a bunch of uh, generations when I was first playing with Dali and Midjourney. So it's, uh, and I was typing in digital humanities to see, I, I was also typing in philosopher's thinking and as you can imagine I was getting white men with beards. Uh, some were so white there were statues, but then I tried digital humanities and I was getting very weird results. But anyway, this is one of the, the results, so I just want to be clear that this is AI generated there. So, so Julianne, do you want to say a few more words on, on, on the origins and structure of the volume? Um, yeah, so it was, uh, it was a great honor when I had the opportunity to join the editorial team with what was then Jeffrey and Stefan, and then Alexandra uh, joined not so long uh, afterwards. We worked with UCL Press, um, so the open access press of University College London, 
Um, and so, yeah, the book is f available fully open access, so please do, and, um, please do go and, and get yourself a copy. And because I'm not on the board of, I, I used to be on the board of um, UCL Press, I'm not anymore, so I can also say for those of you who are interested in open access publishing, they are wonderful, wonderful publishers to work with. And some of the, uh, the processes that other publishers don't have now around uh, actual editorial intervention is still very much there. So I don't know how much on people's horizon UCL Press is in the digital humanities, but it's, uh, it's a wonderful press. So I was so happy to join the editorial board of this book uh, because uh, not only because uh, of its, uh, because of the way that it honors John Bradley, um, who for many of us has been really inspirational in the way that he's combined both making and scholarship and seeing scholarship as, as a path towards making. Um, of course, I had interviewed, in my oral history work, I had interviewed John some years ago and he brought a really, really important perspective um, that of somebody who can, who can straddle uh, that domain of, of making and theory and so on. So that was, a, that was a, a part of the book that made me very happy. What I also really appreciated was the, the chance to work with um, Jeffrey and Stefan, and I have lots and lots of lovely memories of our Zoom calls, um, where we were not only discussing the practicalities of the book, but Jeffrey and Stefan would have been at times talking about Voyant and what they were developing now and riffing about this, pro this process of making. So um, that's a very lovely memory. And we were, of course, uh, very grateful to uh, Stefan Sinclair's um, widow for agreeing that he would still be fully acknowledged. The book was, the, the chapters were very much um, in place. When I joined, we invited one or two further people uh, but they had already done a huge amount of work, so it was very important to acknowledge that. So with that, I shall hand over to our first speaker, which is me, is it? No, sorry. No, was, okay. <laughs> That's okay. We're actually going to pass over to John, uh, John himself. So um, here, for those of you who are interested, there's a table of contents, but there's also a book floating around. And um, if you use the QR code, you can also download the open access one for free, um, which also, of course, has a table of contents. But I'm going to pass over to the man of the hour, who is, of course, John Bradley, um, who will talk about the chapter which he presented within the, the volume, which is Four Corners of the Big Tent, A Personal Journey Through the Digital Humanities. Thank you, Alexander. Lovely. Now, I'm sort of an old guy, and I come from that era when a book like this probably wouldn't have a chapter in it from the person who was being honored. It would be written by friends and colleagues. So this is, uh, to my mind, a little bit of an unusual kind of thing. This is, where is it now? Oh, okay. There's the title of my chapter in the, in the contribution. And I'll say a few moments, in a few couple of moments, I'll be talking about the contents of it, as much as you can say, in just a few minutes. But before I do that, where do I push that here? I simply have to say thank people who worked so hard. I can't, I can't go on any longer without doing it. Because I'm a bit flabbergasted, really, that this book happened at all. And um, so I'm clearly in debt to the editors of the volume, who, if it's like any other book that I've ever been involved in, put in many hours of time into its preparation. And I also, of course, must thank friends and colleagues who deeply who contributed many hours of their time to the writing of the chapters that appear in it. And I think I should take just a second to acknowledge that we've actually lost two, two people who made, were making contributions to this book. Stefan Sinclair passed away, and quite recently we all know that Dino Bugetti passed away, and we miss them terribly, so I'm just taking a moment to acknowledge that. Now, this book is on the subject of making things in the digital humanities, and some of you will know me, and, and, but probably most of you don't, so it may not be entirely obvious what, why, what my connection is here. Well, as I say, I'm an old kind of guy, and I've been in the field for a long time, first at, at, at the University of Toronto, where I worked for about 20 years, and then at King's College London, where I worked for about 25 years. So essentially, that's what I've done largely throughout my career. I survived through times when what it was thought to be when you did DH have ch has changed significantly. And so as a consequence of that, I think, 
my, my, I've opened, I've explored different aspects of what it means to be doing the Ditsu Humanities myself. And hence the, the reference to the big tent idea in the title of the chapter. In the few minutes I have here, and I bet I've already almost used up my five minutes by pretending to not notice that, um, let me give you an overview of what the chapter's about. Well, my four corners are largely these ones that I'm showing you right here. Now, why is this not advancing here? I'll do it this way. Surely we'll do it here. Here we go. As, as I already hinted, as at various times during my, my so-called career, what, what it meant to be doing DH meant rather different things. And my own personal four corners, the ones that I've experienced in myself, are the four that are listed right here. I believe that they also happen to represent the different ways over the years that the academic staff in my department at King's, which was the Department of Digital Humanities, thought, have, have worked on when they thought they were doing DH as well. So of my four personal corners, they, they range from what is perhaps the most conservative kind of DH work, which stays closest to traditional humanities scholarship to a more radical challenge as to what research and scholarship might be. Let me start by looking actually at the last one, that's what the chapter has to say about tool building. Now, I've, I, most of my work has actually been in, in building of, of digital resources, and there we're building tools all the time to get to load data from spreadsheets into things and all that sort of stuff. And I haven't really thought about that very much in the context of what I'm going to say, say here today. The, the tools that I'm more, more thinking of are shown by these, by these two type of tools, which one, one of which was created, and you can guess which one, from very early on in my career, and the other one came along much later. Um, the TACT software, which is the, the, blue, the blue version, it actually ran on a, on a PC, of the earliest PC, in fact, the, five, the 640K and all that stuff, it actually operated in that world. And I think to a large extent, it was a, reason, it was a reasonably successful piece of software in that it sort of captured some of the ideas that were interesting at the time about how text analysis might work on personal computers. Much more recently, I, built the, I took on what's called the Pliny Project. And I don't think it's been so much of a success. And I suspect that for most of you, you don't even know what it is. For that, and that's a hint that the project didn't really succeed particularly well. In the, in the book, I try to talk about why I thought the one worked out fairly well and what went wrong in some sense with the Pliny Project. Most of my time in the field has been really centered on building of digital resources. Highly collaborative work with, with, with scholars from, from different fields, all it turns out mostly from history. And I've done quite a few of these over my time, mostly at King's. So this is only the first, about half of the list of projects which I've been involved in, and in different ways with them, but, but all primarily on the technical side of them. Oops. Wrong button. And there's, and there's the rest of them. So you can see it's quite a number. And I, I have, there's, uh, there's simply no time to show you the broad range of, to show you all of them. But here's screenshots from the types of things that happen. The first two on the left here are both prosopographies. Um, top one's the prosopography of Saxon England. And the bottom one is a screenshot from the People of Medieval Scotland project. We have David Brown here, who, who, was, who was the principal historian and, my, and our collaborator for the, for the creation of this. However, they went all prosopographies. There's the screenshot from The Art of Making up there, which, has, which focused on the work of actually Peter Rockwell, sculptor who lived in Rome, and was interested in looking at Roman sculpture and seeing what evidence there was of how these sculptures were made. And uh, we don't have any time to talk about the bottom, the bottom corner, so let's, let's, let's move on. Out of some of these projects, occasionally some overarching sort of concept would turn up, and I think that's where, really where the DH side of things 
is exhibited most solidly. So here we have um, an important thing for that is the idea of factoid prosopography, which seems to be spreading, and many people seem interested in taking it up. So it, it, it's hit a nerve somehow or other. And our work in terms of defining it more clearly, writing documentation about it. I've created a, a basic ontology for it, which this is part of it you can see there. And, um, but, but I do think that this was definitely a part of what, what was a, a DH contribution. Now, the, th the, th the third category, which I've worked, and I've worked rather less in this, is in using computing, computing tools to do some type of analysis work. That's very prominent in the conference this year in a way that strikes me as more prominent than what it used to be like here, where the emphasis was more on the making of things of the kind that I've just been talking about. And it's not been the nature of my work over the years that I've actually done a great deal of this. However, in the early 1990s, I worked with Jeffrey, there he is, on looking at um, the David Hume's dialogue concerning natural religion, religion and seeing what, what tools of various kinds could, could, could bring out in this text. So we worked with some visualizations. We ended up working with a, a technique called correspondence analysis, statistical technology that does something like what topic mapping does today. And an opportunity came along much more recently to, to work with some social network analysis in the context of, um, of the, um, the peoples of medieval Scotland. I, I didn't actually do this to a large extent. I, I was uh, involved with a team of people, including Davy and Matthew Hammond. Who was, who was really the principal player or players in this. So in the book, I try to think a little bit about the way in which these statistical analysis techniques, such as correspondence analysis, are different, and the way they operate differently in how, how research is done. And I also consider some of the risks that people take on when they, when they take up such technologies in the humanities. Finally, You'll be pleased to know I'm getting near the end here. I, as a chapter, as my chapter points out, the work, some work in the digital humanities is more or less traditional type humanities scholarship, thinking about things, then writing about them. And some of our best known DH people indeed work significantly in this way. I think you know someone like Willard McCarty or perhaps Jerome McGann, various, various people who are very prominent in our field, work primarily in this way. There's a making here, too, going on, of course, the articles, the books, and the book chapters that emerge from, from these new ideas. And when, when, when we write about stuff that focuses on, on DH-type things, but we write about them in ways that look like conventional scholars, it's, it's most easy for institutions like ours to appreciate that we are doing scholarship of the kind that, that they can recognize. Now, I'm certainly not in the league of the big names in our field, but I have written a fair number of articles and book chapters over my many years, and I just happen to list three of them right there to show a range of the types of things that I've done. Now, I have a final thought. You'll be pleased to know I'm down to that point. Oh, I had a final point, but it's not here. Well, that's all right. Yeah. I'll read it out from my notes. One could argue that all academic endeavor involves making one way or another. The difference is what kind of thing is made. Mainstream scholars on, focus on the making of presentations of their research in the form of articles, chapters, and books. But even though these might look quite different from DH things, these conventional products are the product of creative acts in, in somewhat the same way as what DH products are. So perhaps there is actually more common ground than we think here. So, do we get anywhere useful in, in having a dialogue about making in our, in our communities by exploring the ways in which digital tool making or resource building, DH things, are similar and in what ways they're different from creative academic um, writings from more traditional scholars? And if this is useful to think in these terms, I, th I, I think it would then be useful to seriously engage with non-DH academics, trying to get them to sit down and spend some time in a seminar or something to think about where the common elements are what we're doing and where the differences are as well. Thank you.
Thank you, John. I'm going to very, very briefly talk a little bit about the chapter that James Meathis and I co-authored for this uh, book. Thanks to the editors again for all the work you've done. Um, the, um, what I'm going to talk about very briefly, it's mainly the work that John enabled with his career, although he says that my so-called career, um, with, it, with the role that he played, with the attitude he had towards digital scholarship, with the um, focus on making. And without him and what he's done, I wouldn't be here. My colleagues wouldn't have the job they had. And King's Digital Lab wouldn't be what it is. So I'm really, really in debt to him. We all are. Um, so the chapter is, is entitled Sustainability and Modeling at King's Digital Lab. So for those of you who don't know, King's Digital Lab is a a uh, research software engineering unit within the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at King's College London, and is an outgrowth, if you like, of the Department of Digital Humanities, which is still there, very healthy, very big now, with 80 members of staff. The lab, it's only 13 people, but we're all focused on still making things, and in a great part also in sustaining the things that John made with other colleagues before us. Um, so I take, all, even if the chapter is co-author with James, I take all responsibilities for all the mistakes I'm going to make uh, today. Um, and also I give a bit of responsibility to the organizers who put this, uh, organize this panel just the, the morning after the banquet. Um, what what the, the chapter is, is about is what we, we describe as the dimensions of a lab as a multi-layered social technical systems. So obviously the first dimensions that the chapter focus on is the human dimension, roles and responsibilities and careers. And this is where the, the lineage, if you like, from John's uh, career and, and, and the way he shaped it, um, shaped also our roles. And the chapter also talks about the technical dimension, infrastructures and systems, how they evolve and how they continue to evolve. Um, and last but not least, he also uh, addresses the operation, operational dimensions of project life cycles and how the, if you like, the, the legacy of the lab shaped also the, the new activities, the new projects, trying to learn from, from failures as well. Uh, seen in another, in another um, shape, these dimensions are, um, if you like, co-constitutive. Um, so they, they influence each other, so the team at the center the data, the models, and the systems. And what we say with James in the chapter is that the main intellectual ch challenge of the lab is to make these dimensions interact and contribute to what the pragmatic ethos of the, of the team is to make things that um, support and enable uh, research across the arts and humanities and increasingly also social sciences. Um, so what can I say about the human dimension? I think to this, this, this audience, it's probably easy to explain that obviously there has been a generational change in the digital humanities. We're not a very old community, but we're old enough that there has been a change. Um, and also there has been, I think, a reorientation in the field around the sense of what labor means, what precarious labor means, and what sort of roles have we created with the spur of using technologies in the humanities. And so this... this um, this work, this activity, these this changes have prompted um, a sense that what's really sustained the field is the continuity of technical expertise, so the importance of knowledge domain and tacit understanding, so basically the importance of people. Um, so that the model of King's Digital Lab tried to respond uh, to, this, to these changes, to this, um, to this understanding, uh, both with a career development for, for the roles like mine um, and more specifically, defining roles around the research software engineering um, post that we have. And this is the work that mainly the founding director, James Meatis, did um, when he joined, when he was appointed in 2015, when the lab was created. So in the chapter, you'll find some information about this. And as I said, building on, on the roles um, that John had. Um, secondly, the, the chapter also discusses our software development life cycle and operational methods and how we mapped um, if you like, good practices in industry around software development and agile methodologies to a research context, how we try, continuously try to adapt. Um, and in particular, we, we discuss um, briefly the monitoring methods around running projects, the uh, design methods around analyzing um, all the process around requirement elicitations and building, so iterative development. Um, and then finally, the, the maintaining methods. We have all these resources. Uh, that we need to take care of. Um, we've also learned 
in the process how to um, create architectures that are leaner, more modular, uh, less monolithic um, tools um, that we can support. Um, and this is how our archiving and sustainability approach evolves. So again, you see here, I guess, part of the legacy um, connected to John's work. I'm not going to say and summarize all this, but in the, in the chapter you will find information on how we are either maintaining or sustaining these resources, but also how we are integrating this approach into new projects. Um, last but not least, the, the, the chapter also reflects on what, what we think is quite core to the role of these expertise that thinks across projects. So um, you heard from John the example of the factoid, and he did say to me this is really what, what the core of what the H is about. So the idea of abstracting out from specific research context some models that are still obviously constructed, that are still situated, they're still specific, but they try to work across um, different specific research contexts. And that's still a lot of the core of what we do. That's it. Right, thank you very much. It's a great uh, pleasure and privilege to, to be here. And um, the chapter I'm going to summarize it was very much a joint production, and I'm going to read out the five minute summary because it is very much a joint uh, production as well. Uh, Joe Tucker has got another conference uh, that she's at uh, just now. Um, so the chapter by Joe and myself. Uh, as you can see, is entitled The People of Medieval Scotland Database as History. And the core point we were making is the suggestion that a database like this can constitute a historical publication as much as a book or an article. But it is fundamentally different, because unlike a book or article, history becomes an activity that is decentered. And I'll explain a bit about that in a couple of minutes. And we argued that this in turn means that those who are involved in making the database are equally crucial. It is no longer about the skills of developers, analysts, and many others serving the historian. And a key question that we did not address explicitly in our chapter is how to refer, therefore, to a database like the people of medieval Scotland, or POMS for short. And I'll just touch on that at the very end. So POMS, as has been mentioned already, is one of a number of freely available online prosopographical databases whose structure was designed by John Bradley. It includes everyone mentioned in transactional documents relating to the Scottish Kingdom, or likely to have been produced there, between 1093 and 1314, and also in royal documents up to 1371. In transactional documents, the document itself represents a relationship between at least two people, usually more. Every factoid, therefore, is a statement made at the time in a specific social context. The historian's role was to identify each statement. The database was structured to represent each statement's context, which means that John Bradley's role was central. Now, a database like POMS is typically regarded as a research tool, a means to an end rather than an end in itself. For example, one of the most influential theorists of history, Frank Ankerschmidt, explained that his book, Meaning, Truth, and Reference in Historical Representation, published in 2012, was concerned only with historical writing rather than historical research. Here, the past is recreated by an historian author from the sources who then, through their prose, conveys this to readers. Now, Joe Tucker and I, in our chapter, discussed how POMS provides users with a more direct form of mediated access to sources. Users are confronted with a mass of information which has no innate starting point or final destination. Search results are presented as lists or maps or network visualizations. This is in contrast to engaging with the past by reading an article or book where a sense of a single narrative flow is inherent, even if that is not how the reader is interacting with it. 
So in order to make sense of the material in poems, each user has to actively weave their own path through it, forming their own patterns or mini-narratives to a greater or lesser extent. The digital possibilities of a decentered, non-lineal approach to history and a more open relationship between historians and their audiences has been discussed by many people before. POMS is a bit different, however. It is derived from texts, but not itself a database of texts. It makes research material accessible, but without providing a framework for collaboration between historians and the public. In short, its variety of digital capabilities makes the raw material for history writing a destination in its own right, with a myriad of possible personal engagements with the past by its users. As such, it opens the possibility of thinking of history in a pluralistic way, rather than chiefly as history writing or as text. In short, instead of perpetuating a hierarchy of knowledge and understanding, POMS enables anyone with access to the internet to interact, however minimally, with people in the past, both as individuals and in relation to one another. In order to achieve this, the historian is only one of a team of co-creators with particular skills which together are needed to create POMS. As such, POMS could be said to move decisively beyond the idea of history primarily as writing. How, though, should we refer to it and other similar databases? If we refer to POMS as a research tool, do we risk perpetuating the idea of serving the historian in writing history? What about the term historiography? This refers naturally to writing. However, if we, use, if we see POMS as a mode of historiography, this might serve to widen the term to history making and not just history writing. Making, in turn, acknowledges all the roles involved in creating POMS. Thank you very much. So uh, my chapter in the volume on making in the digital humanities is called The History of the Techie in scare quotes, in the history of digital humanities. So I begin my chapter with a quote from John Bradley from 2011, where he wrote that most institutions view the kind of technical contributions which the then Department of Digital Humanities in King's College London makes as a kind of support work. Perhaps in extreme cases, as similar to what is done to the academic's car by his garage mechanics. From this position arises, I believe, writes John Bradley, the application of the diminutive term techie by some to describe those individuals doing this kind of work. So the Digital humanities is a field that often categorizes itself as interdisciplinary and as collaborative. It is a field that describes itself as having been built by a wide range of actors, including technical experts, information professionals, curators, members of the general public through crowdsourcing and citizen science projects and academics. Nevertheless, the contributions of some individuals, like the technical experts referred to in the quote from Bradley that I have on the screen here, have often, not always, but they have often been overlooked and technical work has often been held in lower esteem than the contributions of academics. And it seems to be in some ways a central irony of the field of digital humanities that the closer one gets to the computer in terms of um, actually doing the computational work, um, perhaps the less esteem can be attached to the work and the further away one gets. So the scholar at the end writing their book using the tools, processes, platforms, etc., that have been built for them by technical people, this can be the work, not always, but this can be the work that is very much looked up to. 
a curious thing for a field called digital humanities. So it should be unsurprising then that histories of DH have often foregrounded successful academics, techniques and technologies while neglecting the contributions of many other categories of DH collaborator or co-worker or um, perhaps less uh, successful path. Um, and I know that there has been a turn in recent years to talk about uh, lesser known contributions made to the history of the field, but I think it still can be the case that it is those very successful and landmark uh, actors and uh, points of departure that can still be emphasized in histories of the field. So the chapter that I contributed to the book then uh, argues that we should pay uh, much more attention to what in the history of science is called the peoplescapes, so that wide range of individuals who are involved in the making of digital humanities projects. So this, contempt this contention has uh, a couple of jumping off points mostly drawn from scholarship that's been conducted in other fields. So when we look to the scholarship that is now coming out of fields like the history of computing, the history of science, sociology, the history of the humanities, they are drawing attention to the hidden and devalued labor that has underpinned and indeed engendered many aspects of both our historical and present day worlds. <laughs> Even if I, of course, especially focus on uh, the digital humanities aspects. So looked at in the aggregate, this scholarship has made very important conclusions and I think that the conclusions of this scholarship speak to the necessity for the digital humanities to pay very close uh, and much closer attention to devalued labor. So I'm going to just book, uh, pick a couple of uh, three exemplary texts the first is that uh, by uh, Janet Abbott, her book on recoding gender, women's changing participation in computing. And one of her arguments is that definitions of expertise can be subjective and socially constructed. The esteem in which a role is held may bear little correspondence to the relative importance of that role in the context of a given project. So factors like identity and so on can influence that we hold a role in lower esteem than another, and that may not be due to the internal contributions of that role. So this is the first, we should think again about uh, prestige and esteem. The second then is uh, Marie Hicks in her book, Programmed uh, Inequality, she argues that computing is an explicitly hegemonic project built on labor categories designed to, to per perpetuate particular forms of class status. So she and others in the history of computing and the history of technology argue that technology and computing have been built in the benefit of some and against the benefit of others. So this is something we obviously need very much to interrogate in digital humanities and number three, uh, going back to an oldie but a goodie from the history of science, uh, Stephen Chepa. So he argued in what was at the time a really um, pathbreaking paper that hidden and devalued workers have often made important if quotidian contributions to the execution of scientific and computational projects. And without attention to the contributions of such workers, we cannot know how science is actually done. Because the, public, the publications that, that we read very often necessarily occlude so much of this quotidian and less glamorous work that nevertheless projects have very much relied on. So in my most recent book that just came out in January this year, I have looked at this um, in particularly with regard to feminized labor, though the call that I'm making in my chapters is that we look across the piste at devalued or invisibilized labor. 
And um, my chapter, as I say, takes the perspective in, in this book on the feminized labor that was contributed to the Index Themisticus. It takes it further, and I argue that for digital humanities going forward and for the history of digital humanities going forward, and there does seem to be quite some momentum in the history of digital humanities now, that this attention to the peoplescapes um, and how they have made, not just scholars, but how these, these wide range of individuals, how they have made digital humanities so, is something that we would do very well to focus on. Um, and as we do so, it's very important, I think, think uh, going back to the conference theme about the notion, notion of collaboration, so to look at these other fields that I've mentioned, history of technology, history of science, history of humanities, and so on, I think they've really been pushing ahead with studies of devalued labor and with the questioning of de definitions of expertise. Digital humanities is very important case studies to contribute to this, and I think there's a lot of theoretical and historical frameworks that we can also take in order to, um, to help us to think through this uh, in, a, in a deeper way. So, to those who would respond to me, um, and that have responded to me in the past, that the contributions of digital humanities technical staff have rightly been overlooked in histories of our field, for their contributions were at best quotidian. I counter with the words of the history of computing Mike Mahoney. And Mike Mahoney wrote, whatever one wants to say about sub such abstractions as the Turing machine, it is hard to know how physical computers and the systems running on them could be anything other than socially constructed. Computing has no nature, it is what it is because people have made it so. So thus I contend, it is time for histories of digital humanities, or I contend in my chapter, it's time for histories of digital humanities to consider more carefully the wide range of people who have made it so. I call for devalued and invisible labor to be centered in histories of digital humanities in the coming years. And I call on us to set ourselves within this wider constellation of, histor of scholarship that's looking both back and to the present day and to understand our very fundamental um, interlinks with this world of uh, scholarship that attends to overlooked or devalued labor. Thank you. So I'm uh, the last of the short talks. Um, I have a final chapter that's on uh, partly on a meditation on Stefan Sinclair. And I want to begin, I, I'm going to riff off that chapter. I'm not going to so much talk about that chapter as uh, use that as a starting point. And I want to begin by apologizing that I have no slides. My laptop yesterday started crashing on every 15 minutes or so and ultimately died before I finished my slides and uh, was able to send them to Alexandra. It also put me in the strange position of having to rewrite my talk using this antiquated technology called paper and pen. Now, I imagine all of you are having a little frisson of, oh my God, if I was in Austria and my laptop died, you know, my life would fall apart. So I'm, I'm going through therapy right now. Um, but perhaps this is okay. After all, what I wanted to talk about was collaboration and constraint. So I should be willing to embrace the idea that I'm gonna be constrained by not having PowerPoint and having to use uh, paper to record my thoughts, at least uh, insofar as organizing them for you. And now I'm gonna impose a constraint on you because I'm gonna ask you to imagine a painting by Rembrandt without being able to see the slide on, on which it was. And this is the philosopher in meditation, which comes from, uh, dates from 1632 and is in the Louvre. I'm going to describe it to you so that if you want to, you can close your eyes and, and conjure it up. In the center right is the philosopher with their back to the wall, sitting, their eyes closed, lit by the beautiful warm sun coming through the window, and they are meditating. In the center is this staircase that like a gyre suggests the thought of this philosopher sort of rotating, spiraling up. 
And what most people miss is in the lower right-hand corner, almost cut off, as if, were this a photograph, as if the person had, had, had not framed it properly, is a small second source of light, a fire, and a crouched figure, a servant, or perhaps the philosopher's wife, heating the room and probably cooking dinner. Now, some people have actually speculated that this painting was not meant to be the philosopher, but was meant to be uh, Tobit and Anna waiting for their son, which would then suggest that the philosopher is not really meditating, but has fallen, is Tobit falling asleep waiting for his son. I don't know about you guys, but I fell asleep many times waiting for my children to come home late at night, so I, I know that feeling. But I give this image to you or I offer this image because I think it captures the unfairness of a certain view of what humanists, or at least philosophers, do. It captures the way we think of the work of philosophy, the work of thinking, as being that solitary work of the bearded white male of a certain age who is not supported by anyone, but only when you look down in the corner do you realize that the room is warm because someone is tending the fire and he is um, able to sit there and meditate because somebody is feeding him. I could draw your attention, and I do the little bit of this in the chapter, to the uh, almost contemporary work by Descartes, The Meditations, which of course makes the argument that the way we should do metaphysics is to shed, to doubt everything that has been written by other people. We shouldn't collaborate at all. In fact, you could argue, if one wanted to be critical of, De of Descartes, that he builds up his own metaphysics guided in the certainty that it isn't tainted by anybody else's thought by any collaboration. And of course, that is a founding document in philosophy, enlightenment thought, uh, you know, in effect, authorizing us to, to act as if we were geniuses alone. So now that was, that's one work that I want to present as what we should not consider the way we do things which we are often tempted to, to act as if. And I want to present a second work to you, and that's the thesis that Stefan Sinclair wrote and presented in, um, he actually presented his work in the 1997 and then 1999 ACH LLC conference, uh, but he defended his thesis in 2000. And this was a work in which he, uh, he, he uh, talked about his first piece of uh, uh, in-browser text analysis software called Hyperpo. Uh, the work has two parts. It has a part in which he talks about Hyperpo, and as you can imagine from the word hyper, this was a time in which we were all hyper about hypertext. There were conferences about hypertext. If you look at the proceedings for the ACH ALLC, you'll see that hypertext, there was usually a whole stream of it. Where has it gone? Well, anyway, that's another story. But uh, that's half of it. Oh, and the Po is Ulipo, because he was fascinated by the, the ideas of the, of the Ulip, uh, Ulipian uh, sort of workshop, if you will, Ouvoir de la Littérature Potentielle, who were playing with constraints as a way of being generative, of, of creating poetry by constraining yourself. And his own thesis, in some ways, can be thought of, he was, he was building software as a form of constraint for interpreting Olympian uh, literature. In fact, the second part of the thesis, he, he uses Hyperpo to read Georges Perec's La Disparition, a novel which I have not read, but, but is a novel in which the letter E is not used, and the absence of E is actually one of the, uh, the plot features. Uh, bringing these two together, uh, I would suggest that one of the things Stefan was playing with was how software is not only about opportunity, but it's about constraint. And that in that constraint, what it stops you from doing, the way it focuses you on certain things but not others, the way it hides stuff, in those constraints, it can actually be generative or, or creative. 
I don't know if he had this on his mind, but I know that if I was in conversation and told him, yeah, I think this is what you were playing with back then, I'm sure he'd go off and build a version of Voyant in which the first thing I had to do is decide which tools would not work. And, and, and you had to pick at least four and uh, be constrained. Anyway, I conclude by suggesting that this idea of constraint is something we can think about and celebrate and embrace. And I want to suggest four constraints that we need to uh, not just confront, but embrace. The first is the constraint of collaboration. When you collaborate, you can't do what you want to do and only what you want to do. You've actually, you know, in theory, should listen to the other person. And there is something very generative. Uh, we, we all know this, that you know, other people actually have often better ideas than you do. The second constraint, and this is something we're all haunted with now, or at least I am, is sustainability. The projects we're building are not sustainable. And what's actually so generative about sustainability is it's led to this fabulous sort of um, movement, the minimal computing movement, in the sense that the, the very thing that is, is haunting us is also creating an opportunity to reimagine software that's more modest, humble, that does things with fewer resources, doesn't need the whole stack of stuff that that we apply for massive grants for. The third one, and this has been mentioned before, is labor. I want to suggest to you that the time has come to stop trying to do more, to stop trying to ask our students to read more. I don't know about you guys, but you know, I go into curricular meetings and, and there's this sort of inflationary process. Oh, PhD in philosophy. They have to have done this, that, and the other thing. And then somebody else says, well, no, Hegel. They've got to written you. So we end up with these bloated curricula. Perhaps we should begin to ask people to do less, to allow them to do less, expect less of our associations, expect less of our graduate students, of our peers. Give them more time. And last of all, and I say this in, in complete, uh, completely understanding that when I say it, I'm going to demonstrate that I'm a hypocrite. We have to stop flying as much. If you look at the carbon footprint of the university praxis, and there's a great report out of USB, you know, we're getting good at making environmentally sound buildings, where, where we have carpools, one thing or another, but flying to meetings and conferences is going up. And as, you know, it went down for briefly for COVID. We have to begin to ask, how can we meet and exchange ideas without flying that much? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, for those much needed provocations. I'm sure um, people will have some questions. We were going to give a bit of a, a panel discussion now. We thought that that might be the most engaging way of picking up on so many of these themes um, that have been raised um, in those brief overviews of the chapters. Um, and I think one of the most important questions to, to start with, um, and that I'm going to offer to, to our panelists here, is this one here, and it's about your experience, because so much of this book is, is based on the personal experiences of making. It's in many ways a history of the making experience within digital humanities. And so I want to ask you about the politics of making, because it's impossible to disentangle oneself from that. You know, who gets to make? Who gets the credit for making? We've touched on that a little bit already. And who is being overlooked? Who's responsible um, and for what? And I'd like to, to hand actually over to Dovit to start with um, uh, on that question, if that's all right. Thank you. Oh, all right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yes, well, just to be uh, very brief, I mean, uh, obviously, Joanna Tucker and myself, we, we addressed this not explicitly, but it's, it just runs through everything, uh, really. Um, but as we know, um, it's, it's just, and we've all been talking about this, actually, in various ways. It's, uh, you know, you've got academics and, and others who are given support rules. And I must say that, um, just to make an even more general point, um, straight ever so slightly, I think in universities, certainly in my experience, I'm currently Dean of Research for Arts and Humanities in my university, uh, professional services uh, colleagues are 
uh, absolutely essential and uh, actually brilliant people and uh, they get overlooked uh, routinely as well and uh, so my main um, uh, desire uh, which uh, Joe would share is just thinking about how we talk about all this and you just sit, talk referring to people as support well let's think about that um, and as I've said what we think of as the as the as the outputs um, you know, the ultimate goal of what we're uh, trying to do, uh, think, think about that as well. So I'm afraid that's a very incoherent answer, but it's almost brief. Um, so in, uh, in research that I did on Roberto Busa and the Index Domesticus, and I studied how the Index Domesticus project was covered in various newspapers um, in the 1950s and 1960s, in German newspapers, Italian newspapers. And what really, really fascinated me was how um, both making and makers seem to be very subjective uh, identities and processes in these newspapers. So there's a whole load of wonderful photographs um, when Busa is standing next to a key punch machine and um, when Father Busa is, is pictured, then we, we hear about how he's um, working with uh, robot brains or he's using some very advanced machine. And then when, when, key punch, when female key punch operators stand next to the very same machines, um, they're described as, very often they're reduced just to a hand, they're basically cut out of the photos, and there's just some very prosaic, uh, something being punched. Um, or there's another article, and it starts with a little bit of a joke, um, that Busa himself may actually have been punching texts. And then later it's revealed, haha, a yeah, priest wouldn't do something so frivolous, and so on. So, um, yeah, I laughed so much when I read that. So, uh, so, so anyway, so the point for me is that this, this sort of, um, that making was, was just, uh, and, and even technology to some extent, that they seem to be all highly, highly subjective and, and the, the, the collocation between the, the piece of technology or the act of making and the person who was executing it seemed to sort of directly impact uh, how this was, was to be uh, perceived. Um, and I think this is something it would be, I think this is also known from the history of computing, right? There's been a whole lot of studies that have shown something similar. Um, but for me, this, is, this goes right to the, the core of the politics of of making that, that we're dealing with um, something that's, that's uh, highly um, contingent and subjective. I think Ariana had something to, to add maybe to that. Do you, do you have a slide there? It's, again, my answer is quite pragmatic in, in, in this case and was referring to, as, as I mentioned in the chapter, we talked a bit more about the roles um, in the lab and how they're defined and uh, James Meadies wrote a blog post in 2019 where it, when he, I think, tried but quite successfully to define a continuum of those um, roles around making within the research software engineering um, uh, career path going all the way from research support for those people that are very close to the systems and without whom we couldn't operate, for example, our system managers, um, all the way to uh, research active people in the lab that might act as what you would describe as traditional um, principal investigators in, in research grants and they bring in a lot of uh, work into conceptualize a project from the beginning. Um, but the, the, the conclusion of that blog was also that the majority of us within the lab fit within this central area of uh, research intensive people that kind of a span between analysis, design work, engineering itself, um, data modeling and so on. So I think it, it's an interesting model. Obviously each context is different, um, but it was a way to answer that question of you could have within those, um, those roles around um, making, 
still quite a layered um, approach and be inclusive about different types of contributions that are all, all valued and, um, and all very needed, especially in a field where you need to make things that work. I'm going to skip ahead so we can get John's thoughts immediately on something. Um, to John. <laughs> I was wondering if you might talk to us a little bit about important patterns of collaboration that you have experienced and maybe give us some of the outlines and the contours of the problems and, and the difficulties of collaboration that you've experienced. Yes, well, of course, I, it's true that I've only had a certain type of collaborative work in my career and other people in the DH with other relationships to the DH field will have rather different types of experience. People who work with large language models, for example, have to collaborate with, with people who really understand that those technologies very well, and those are often academic people, and that's a different type of relationship than the one which I primarily experienced. We tend as, because I, I come into these many projects I've been involved in supporting the, the technical work that needs to be done, primarily. I'm certainly viewed that way almost always by the, by the academic partners that, that we um, have, at least at the beginning. Later on, they're not quite sure what I'm doing to their project, but at, at least at the beginning, they, they think mostly in those terms. And I think what we really... So, so we have these two different groups. There's, there's, a, there's a whole set of issues around respect involved in this, that, that respect is, is really needed so that the, the scholar will understand that the work that, that, that the technical people are doing has its own academic and intellect, well, more intellectual challenges that are at least, well, not always, but at least significantly challenging in the way that their own intellectual challenges are as well. And so, so this, this is not a trivial matter to put, put these projects together, and certainly shouldn't be anyway, at any rate. We also need to think a little bit about commitment for these, for these projects. And it's not only commitment by the people doing the project, providing a framework within our institutions that allows for these commitments to actually exist and happen. So in the case of the technical people, which is, of course, what I can mainly speak to, we, the, the institution needs to provide some commitment that those people who are doing that, including me, have, have, have some type of career that they're brought into projects in a way so that they have enough time to really richly engage with the project work that they're working on, rather than just, in some sense, being brought in to do little bits of work here and there that, that, that the technical people need to provide. My, I, I think we had with Harold Short in my department someone who really understood this, these two issues particularly well. And so we really were quite blessed with that, with that type of environment. I think we, we now, some, some of that understanding has been passed into what's been happening at KDL. I think KDL also, the people there understand, and they've got themselves set up in a place so that, that, the, that the school to which they report to also have people who understand this. So that's really quite an achievement, and I think we have to applaud that. If I might then, just to tack on to that, could I ask you all to reflect on the following? Because it, it's a lot about the history, and I think we've, we've talked about that, but I think it's really important to look forward and to, to build on those experiences. For you all, working in, in different parts of the tent, um, we might say, what does the future of this making process look like in, in DH for both maybe yourselves or, or kind of looking more broadly to the field? What futures potentially then would you also like to see? What, would, what should the future of making and collaboration perhaps look like? Uh, I'll try to answer that with a slight, uh, answer a slightly different question in the sense that I give a lot of public outreach. I go to high schools and so on like that. And the, the future that youth are worried about right now is, is there being no work thanks to AI. And this is in part due to the rhetoric of AI. And of course, we're seeing these stories, you know, uh, news organizations that are firing journalists and saying, you know, Chad GPT can write stuff. Uh, lawyers using... ChatGPT to produce rubbish, um, uh, uh, artists that are suing uh, OpenAI and other organizations. So this is one of the concerns that I think a lot of people have is how is AI going to automate certain um, knowledge work that people, especially youth, were hoping would be there for them. And uh, so I'm going to stop there and pass it to someone else. 
Um, yeah, so I'm really excited to see how I can productively incorporate Chat GPT into my uh, into my workflows. That's my big aim for the summer to try to figure out how how I can get it to to really help me. Um, so in response what, to the question, what does the future of making look like in the digital humanities? So I might give a, a digital humanities specific response if that's okay. So in, in the introduction, Jeffrey, that we wrote to, to this volume, we say one story we tell about the digital humanities is that it is a field that values practices of making digital artifacts as scholarship. And... Um, uh, so I think maybe this has already begun, uh, and um, but I think one future for us is to is to recognise that as exactly a story, and because we've seen this as a story, maybe we haven't critically engaged with this story as much as we should, and um, and really done some of the work to some of the theoretical work and historical work and um, and analytical work. To, to really show um, uh, that this is the case, that this isn't just something that's assumed that we do, but this is something that we, that we very intentionally uh, reflect more and more on. Um, it seems to me oral history, it's nice to look for comparative examples. It seems to me that oral history, which positions itself very much in the same way, it says that it, it reaches theory through making, it thinks through making. And oral history has done an awful lot of work uh, around this. Um, you know, one outcome of this being really embracing the, the, the subjectivity of the oral history interview. And uh, so, yes, I think, we, uh, I think for digital humanities, and it has, it has started, but I think there is a lot more and that's, that we can do. And this is going to be very fascinating. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I should probably begin by confessing that I don't identify myself as a digital humanist, and it's curious that we've ended up with me sitting here on my own. But anyway, here we are. Uh, that, that was for you, you know. Um, anyway, so, um, so, so that's uh, just important to bear in mind because what the future looks like, um, well, my impression of being here uh, is it just reinforced, uh, you know, hearing so many of the papers which are uh, so many of them are really really interesting and inspiring what really strikes me is how digital humanities I mean it's huge it's so varied so much going on but what always is going on is really thinking very hard and precisely about the uh, so many things that are fundamental to humanities I mean text to take an obvious example um, thinking really hard about that, uh, but the same thing applies to what we're talking about here, um, how we think about uh, properly, uh, you know, a fair, just way of acknowledging all the dimensions of research, being much more articulate about that than we usually are in the humanities. I think practice research is, they're much better at this uh, than humanities generally. So what I would like to see is just a, a more explicit acknowledgement, acknowledgement of all this in humanities generally, that digital humanities is fundamental, not because you necessarily want to engage with particularly awesome programs, etc., cetera, um, but just as a way of thinking and how we all benefit from that. At this conference, this, this, this time, I, I came away thinking that many of the people are, are not using the image of making behind the type of things that they're doing. It's the, the word exploring, I think, captures is closer to what, how they think about what they're doing. And if there is a making component to it, and I think there might be, I think some rethinking about how this exploring fits with the analogy of making is maybe timely to do. Um, I don't know how we do that, but maybe that's timely. But um, it strikes me that we might try to find some way of bringing together this exploring, added, this exploring component with the making ideas. I was going to, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I was going to some, say something again about 
laboratories and how I see, well, not just me, but a recent, in a recent article we wrote with a philosopher, I know you corrected it, but actually it's called French with two small f, Patrick French. Um, we, we think that we could do more in thinking of our laboratories as techno-philosophical techno experiments. Um, and I, I read a sentence that we wrote there, there's nothing alien about living in intimate proximity to technology. In this sense, the world of ADH laboratory should be conceived as being as natural as a rainforest, brimming with life and interdependencies, a complex system that brings forth emergent outputs through interaction across its components parts. And next, and obviously this talks a lot also about the the new modeling practices that bring the machine much more into play than probably it used to be in the past. The core challenge of the laboratory remain in, remains in developing a technological culture, as Hugh calls it, conceiving of research software engineers as mechanologues working in partnership with machines, bust in the bust. Uh, the myth of hyper-rationalized computing wide open by introducing uncertainty, the unexpected, and creativity to design and development. And in this sense, I think the new initiatives, such as, for example, um, the plant, which is a new lab in the, at the University of Maastricht, give us a, a way to rethink also our labs. I know that in a way we might think, oh, King's Digital Lab was only uh, founded in 2015, but it has a for the context where we, we are in, quite a long history. So I find it quite inspiring to look at new examples of labs that are, they think of themselves starting from a metaphor, in this case, a natural metaphor, and trying to reinvent the way they create partnerships, um, extending beyond the humanities, working in social sciences and other areas. So yeah, I think the future hopefully is bright. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to take the advantage of the creative, imaginative, productive nature of the time constraint um, to now open the floor to some questions. Um, hopefully we have some microphones that can be passed around and hopefully I can find the right slide. Does anyone have any questions that they'd like to put to our panel? I think there's someone here. Thank you so much for that. I really enjoyed this panel. And you know, you know a good panel when you're like, I have 15,000 questions I want to ask, and how do I choose the one to ask? So I'm kind of, kind of, kind of sneak two in. Because the first thing that struck me is how many different kinds of practices you have evoked in your descriptions of making. From John talking about writing articles as making, to collecting and curating as a form of making, to creating tools as a form of making, and then I would add to that things like you know creating institutions, creating curricula, creating interactions with artists, uh, public outreach. These are all different kinds of interactions. Does that plurality in the way we think of making is that is that a bug or a feature? Is that something that we need to explore as something that? Um, and again, because there are there's this negative side of making. So is that something that hurts us in trying to really establish making as a, a, an epistemic act, or is that something that helps us to to, to explore? I mean, and maybe that's and maybe that is actually it. Maybe you've already answered my question before I even asked it. And the second half of this is about um, this question of prestige and why it is. Is that a humanities problem? Is it that we don't have the same kind of, you know, there, is, there, there isn't an applied humanities the same way where there would be an applied uh, branch of physics or applied branches of the biosciences? So is this sort of difficulty we have in recognizing some of the labor that goes into making, and again, the epistemic layers of that, is that something that has a lot to do with our roots in disciplines that are very much more um, in the theoretical, or is that something that is, is wider? Um, the, I'm just going to give one type of uh, the great questions, and there's a lot there, but um, uh, Baird has a book about, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember the title now, but, but he points out how the humanities have been disciplines of discourse, and we've tended mm -hmm. to think that, mm -hmm. that you know, put it bluntly, it's sort of, if you haven't written a book, you haven't done anything. And um, I know a lot of what Stefan and I were trying to do was to try to argue that a, a, a tool or some software or a public outreach, that they bear knowledge. And it's not, it's not the case that only 
books and articles bear knowledge. And we all know the structure of the university, how it counts those things, and so on and so on. We've all, I'm sure everyone here has, you know, spent a lot of time doing something that doesn't get on the CV or doesn't get counted or, or gets, you know, some, some jackass or it goes, oh, you know, there's multiple authors, so, you know, this doesn't count for anything. Uh, so that's one one answer of we're inherited. I think there's uh, y your first question about the types of making. On the one hand, I want to say absolutely. There was that whole hack versus yak, and I, th I hope that w part of what came out of it, it was all the different ways of making that didn't involve programming, as you said, curating and something like that. But we also need to be aware, the moment you expand any concept to include everything, it becomes meaningless. So, so we also need to, to think about the differences between, uh, if you will, making and perhaps some of the other types of things that we do, um, administering, maintaining, caring. The world, of course, is always a complete muddle. And we never really quite know how things work and how they fit together. And we sometimes try to, to provide models and explanations that operate to a certain extent to explain how things are. And I think the making as a paradigm is, is a bit of an example of that. Within, within our community, within, within, within the university in general, people are doing a whole bunch of different types of things. Making is only a part of what they're doing. But putting what they are doing through the prism of the making image can sometimes bring attention to things that we hadn't noticed before about what they are doing, even if they don't think they're doing making themselves. And, Perhaps in that way, it's a useful thing to do. I mean, the humanities scholarship is full of examples of that type of suddenly an idea comes up and, it, and it, they, it's tried to be applied to explain absolutely everything. And it works better in some places than others. But it's still interesting in the places where it doesn't quite work properly. And I think that may be how we should be looking at making mm -hmm. in this context. So I think this question about um, whether this is sort of an inheritance of the humanities is very interesting and very important. Um, and also maybe the question as to why, if we see ourselves as inherently dis interdisciplinary, then it's then we've moved somehow closer to the humanities rather than, than to the fields that that would be more more open to this. I mean, I, I do think you're you're absolutely right that it that it must be an inheritance of of the humanities and um, and also the esteem economies and and the sort of those places where where digital humanities um, was first established and evolved from. Um, but I, I I do have a sense that um, that it might just be the case that. That as more and more, as more and more material is retrodigitized, and we have ever more um, data sets and collections at our disposal, at our disposal, that, that even the humanities themselves will move more in, in this practice making and applied direction. That it, it will just become a, a natural momentum through <laughs> proliferating data. So maybe just because it has been so, I'm hopeful that that it might not have to remain so as wonderful as the humanities is, that's not, a, a, you know, but other futures are, are possible too. We have time, I think, for um, a couple more questions, if anyone has anything that they'd like to, to offer to the panel. In which case, I'll put one forward, because I, I have the wonderful privilege of being here. Um, it's, it's wonderful that we can conceptualize this, but um, if we bring it a little bit more down to earth, you know, in the institutions that you are currently in, affiliated with, working with, you know, how, how actually can we start to foster this, this, you know, new DH, this kind of understanding of DH as a collaborative practice which does acknowledge and uh, integrate and, you know, express respect for all those involved in the making process? You know, what are the things that hopefully institutions across the globe that you know our, our wonderful audience are, are involved in what what should they be doing what potentially might be kind of concrete solutions or steps towards this more equitable understanding of, of dh practice uh, 
Uh, thanks, Alexandra. Uh, some, some things are, again, quite pedestrian, if you like, but it, it's a way to align, I guess, a change of culture. And by the way, I do think that the humanities can contribute also to make changes in the sciences with due respect, because this recognition element, especially with, with, uh, with respect to research technical or technology professional, affects the sciences as well. But the humanities can make the sciences as well understand the importance of culture and the cultural element and so on. So I think, I think we can do also something to, to, to help the, our colleagues. Um, yeah, so pragmatically, for example, in our institution, there has been, first of all, a focus on research integrity, again, at the, at, across disciplines, that has brought in new resources to think of how we can have a better, more inclusive research culture, recognition, so there are now new policies around fair publication and what that means. Um, the, the, the new, um, the institutional framework, sorry, the national, research evaluation framework in the UK, the REF, is also now open a consultation around what are outputs that are different um, from the traditional outputs, not only in the humanities, but indeed across the board. Um, the consultation is now open, and so we can do a lot in redefining and rethinking what research products are and how knowledge production comes to be, and therefore also inform this framework that might be, constrain, might, might be constrain, constraining, but could also maybe be an opportunity to, to, to rethink um, our research is produced. And then last but not least, also in terms of careers, um, again, national and international funders are, are rethinking, I think, uh, the, the contribution that different roles could, could give to research. Um, and therefore, within universities now, there is a sense that uh, we need to think beyond the traditional academic path. Um, University College London has um, had a pilot last year, I think, with respect to research software engineers, engineering careers and how promotions could be identified within those categories and be, be creative in, again, rethinking, um, you know, is a software module a research product? Well, of course it is. So why is it not part of how criteria could be re rethought in terms of promotions? Um, so in our, in our university, we're trying again to work with colleagues um, from, from other disciplines as well to see if we can implement something similar or, or test something similar. Um, but maybe last, again, very pedestrian point is give more stable roles um, and make the case for having more stable roles beyond uh, specific project funding, going back to that, that point that we do know that that's how we can sustain the, the knowledge and, and, uh, um, yeah, in the field. Probably the last word for me is that my, that my, my career in San Francisco has been really weird in terms of an academic, in an academic institution. I worked for a long time, as you know, but I was not really made an academic, given an academic contract until 2011. And I retired in 2015. Now, why did this happen? This is a bit of a peculiar thing to do, don't you think? I think it had to do with, it was the way by which the institution could establish conventional value for the work that I was doing. I, they wanted to submit me into the REF, and I had to be an academic to do so. So the, it really had to do with that. And I think that's, that's a significant sign that we really need to find other ways to, to establish and recognize value that people work than doing that. Because for me, this shift into academia this may not surprise you entirely, was not, an, it was not a complete and wonderful thing. It had its good things about it, but it also had its less desirable things attached to it too. And I think I, would, I might have done actually a richer end to my career if that hadn't have happened, frankly. So. So I do, I do something that's probably very, very conservative and um, that is, I make clear to all of my team that um, as amazing as their making work is, they will need to have books and, scholar and, and articles to go with this work if, if they want to go on an academic track. And um, I, so, I, so I'm very clear about that and I actually build in project time for this as well. So, so in one of the projects, the Sone Lab, it's gonna be the next panel, shameless advertisement, if anybody's looking for a panel after the break, we're gonna be talking about, not this question, but the project itself. So we build in um, uh, 
uh, so-called shut up and write sessions. I know that sounds very rude, but it's what a former colleague called it. So three hours a week, we take project time to write. And that's to ensure that everybody is going to formally tick the boxes of what they need so they, at the end of the project, so they can be in the best position possible to, um, to go further if they choose. But also, I think it's a, it's a huge world, isn't it? And, and for people who, who have done making art, the skills are infinitely transferable and um, academia is far from the only path that's out there. So, so that's another important perspective. Yeah, we're running out of time, I know, and, uh, and there's so much to say, um, inevitably. So just to pin it down, I think the, um, I mean, these are really interesting times, actually. I think uh, institutionally uh, for um, not just the way our wretched UK ref encourages to do certain things, but I think there's, there's momentum for a much wider uh, understanding of what uh, research is about that is in innately collaborative and uh, so my basic point would be to see DH in this regard as part of a wider landscape where uh, there's much more emphasis on the on, on co-creation all the dimensions of it uh, not just in doing the early stages of the research but thinking about what you do with it afterwards and uh, the people you engage with uh, beyond academia um, and uh, seeing that as part of the co-creation and the research as well. Uh, so having a much broader, looser uh, sense of what we mean by research and all the ways that can be acknowledged, um, which I'm happy to say in our university, in my university, we are working on so and have been for quite a few years. Thanks. Okay, in which case I'd like to thank our panel because we're, we're unfortunately out of time. Um, thank our panel once again for, for these wonderful contributions. Thank our audience who are at this point undoubtedly coffee deprived. Um, but in the spirit of what we also are trying to represent here, I'd really like to thank the team who are being hidden away in the corner here without whom um, none of this would be happening. So thank you all. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.